So let's start. I trust you can hear me? Yes. Okay. So this is the session on better care, enhancing outcomes for mothers and children. I see many familiar faces and friends here. Hello to all of you. I'm Kathy Anastas. I'm a general internist, HIV provider for many years, since 1981, I guess. And I'm at the Albert Einstein College of Medicine in the Bronx and also work in Central Africa. Um, my co-chair is Elizabeth, Elizabeth Bukusi, who was at uh, Kemri, the Kenyan Medical Research Institute, and also at the University of Washington in Seattle in the United States. Um, we'll just go to our first presentation, uh, which is Cherie Schwartz who was an HIV epidemiologist at the Center for Public Health and Human Rights at Johns Hopkins School of Public Health in the United States. Her research lies at the intersection of HIV and women's health with a particular interest in the health of vulnerable and marginalized uh, populations at increased risk of HIV. And she'll be speaking to us about HIV and pregnancy outcomes from a safer conception clinic. Thanks very much to the, to the organizers for this opportunity. I just want to acknowledge my collaborators and co-authors from Vic Copen Clinic and Johns Hopkins University as well as University of Antwerp. There are a lot of data now to demonstrate that people living with HIV, both men and women, frequently want to have children in the future. However, there are also quite a few data to show that uh, patient level and provider level knowledge about how to conceive safely are pretty limited. There are very few safer conception services that exist in low and middle income settings within the public sector for HIV affected couples. And so what our research project endeavored to, to address was, was this evidence gap to assess the feasibility of safer conception services uh, within a South African setting and to demonstrate effectiveness. So safer conception can be thought of as a rights-based approach to HIV prevention. So trying to support a woman's reproductive health and reproductive rights, and also trying to achieve HIV prevention goals to the partner uh, and to a potential child. So these services aim to target, to reach, uh, serodifferent couples in particular, in particular, but also seroconcordant positive couples and partners in which the status of one person is unknown. The basic package of care that's often recommended for safer conception services and that we've been offering uh, is HCT for the HIV negative partner, viral load monitoring for the positive partner, STI screening and treatment for both partners, and delayed conception, promoting contraception until uh, the couple is clinically ready to conceive. And so that's the basic package really promoted for everyone and then the other strategies end up being more tailored based on the couple situation. So when we started this study, this was prior to uh, treatment for all in South Africa. So we were offering uh, treatment uh, for all CD4 counts as part of the Safer Conception Service. And in addition to that, we offer PrEP for HIV negative couples if their uh, positive partner doesn't want to take treatment, won't come into the clinic. If they're having some adherence issues, this is a bridging strategy that is available. Uh, we promote male medical circumcision uh, within our center for HIV negative men. Self insemination is an option if there's an HIV negative male partner that we provide counseling around, as well as timed condomless sex limited to periods of peak fertility. So, this is really an approach that provides patients with options and they choose for themselves what pieces of the intervention, given their situation, they choose to take up. Sakamani Safer Conception Clinic is centered in a large primary healthcare center in Johannesburg, South Africa. We enrolled patients from July 2013 to July 2017 as part of this demonstration safer conception cohort. It was a prospective clinical cohort in which patients came back, uh, were recommended to come back on a monthly basis. Uh, they would do routine pregnancy testing and HIV testing at each visit and receive additional counseling as well as ART clinical management. So it was really a one-stop shop. So in terms of utilization, we had 526 individuals, including 334 men and 192, 334 women, excuse me, and 192 men. 
57% of the couples represented uh, attended together with both partners. 43% uh, of the couples represented were only uh, attended by the female partner. About half of our couples were serodifferent, so the one partner was HIV positive and one was HIV negative. 44% were serosame positive partners, and in 7% of the cases, the status of one partner was unknown, and we never were able to ascertain it because they never came to the clinic. In terms of our characteristics, at baseline, women were on average 34, men 37 years. Most of the women and men had children in the past, were living with HIV, were already established on ART. However, even though many of our participants were already established at ART when they came in for safer conception care, 61% of the women were virally suppressed at, eight, at baseline and 46% of the men. During follow-up, we had 3,000 visits. 88% of the couples had at least one follow-up visit, 85% of the women and 62% of the men. The average number of visits during follow-up was seven and a half per woman and nearly four per man. Overall, we had 99 pregnancies amongst 88 women. The time to pregnancy, sorry, amongst 89 women, the time to pregnancy was on average 1.1 year. However, as you'll see in this Kaplan-Meier, the time to pregnancy did differ by HIV status. So uh, the rate of pregnancy incidence among HIV negative women was higher than that of HIV positive women. One of the thing that things that delays time to pregnancy is that when pe people come to our clinic, they're not necessarily ready to conceive. So part of the job of the Safer Conception Service is to make sure that people know that they um, are ready to conceive and that they're given the green light, so to speak, or a go-ahead. So two-thirds of our clients uh, received the go-ahead during the study, 7% conceived prior to receiving that go-ahead, and about a fourth uh, attended but then were stopped attending the clinic before they received the green light. On average, it took about five months um, in order to get that go-ahead. It was longer for HIV positive than HIV negative women. In terms of the incidence rates, uh, our incidence was 41 uh, pregnancies per 100 person years. And again, it was higher amongst those who were uh, HIV negative than HIV positive. Uh, and that finding also held if you consider the time of analysis, not just from enrollment, from, but from time of readiness to conceive to conception. 17% of the pregnancies were conceived through self-insemination and 83% through timed condomless sex. Two-thirds of the HIV-negative clients uh, had at least one retesting during follow-up. On average, women received six tests and men two and a half. And in terms of the pregnancy outcomes uh, of the 99 pregnancies, 67% uh, have delivered. About 25% uh, resulted in miscarriage or an ectopic pregnancy. And a few of the cases, a few of the women are still pregnant. In terms of the HIV outcomes, uh, of the 21 HIV negative women that conceived, 52% of them conceived on PrEP. Even though PrEP uptake was, was, not relative, was not too high in this cohort, we did see relatively um, large number of women conceive on, on PrEP given the overall uptake. Amongst HIV positive women, at the time of pregnancy diagnosis, 87% were virally suppressed using the threshold of the South African guidelines of under 50 copies uh, per mil, and using a threshold of 1,000, 99% percent were virally suppressed at the time of pregnancy diagnosis. For the 87 percent of HIV exposed babies that um, so far we have seen, uh, none of them were living with HIV, none were infected, and none of the male or female partners have been infected throughout the course of the study. So to summarize, this is some of the first real world data that's coming out of a specific safer conception service in sub-Saharan Africa. We found the services were feasible to implement with women and men, although just under 60% of the men came in. We actually kind of thought that was a win, that we were able to get 60% of the men. Um, pregnancy incidence was high, um, but we did see that HIV-positive women had lower conception rates than HIV-negative women, and many of the women did not conceive by six months and had to be referred to other fertility services, which largely do not exist in this setting. The setting does have limitations in that it was a set in a real world setting and it was not, you know, a closely uh, 
randomized trial with, with very close monitoring. So there were, we did extensive follow-up where we could, but there were some individuals that uh, did not return to the service and, and we are not sure if they became pregnant or if there were HIV infections that we're unaware of. So to close, I just wanna talk about a few points that I think are important when just trying to situate these findings. And I think one is that a lot of people have asked me, and I've been thinking a lot myself, is this a relevant intervention in the context of U equals U? And I think one thing that our data suggests is that while, I th while our team fully supports um, the science and the evidence behind U versus U, what we've learned is that you can't assume that when couples are trying to get pregnant that they're already virally suppressed. We saw high viral, uh, lack of viral suppression at baseline, and we do see prolonged attempted conception amongst these couples. So I think in thinking about interventions that are related to promoting reproductive rights are important. Furthermore, given the data that's recently come out of Botswana related dolutegravir and the, the rollout of DTG that's going to be happening, I think thinking about fertility planning and fertility uh, desires of couples is gonna become even more important. Um, safer conception strategies, I think our data suggests that they can be effective, but they also highlight some potential barriers. So when you're thinking about offering a service, following couples up and, and keeping them in your care for multiple months while they're trying to get ready to conceive and then conceive is a very long and labor intensive process. I think we need to think about getting evidence around how many visits would, would be necessary. Viral load monitoring is expensive, but, but I do think it is important. And really trying to you know, think about subfertility as a potential barrier to success and also what, what scale up models would look like. So this was a one stop shop with a dedicated provider. That's not gonna be cost effective. And so how these models can be effectively integrated into services without uh, the fertility and reproductive intentions of couples just kind of getting ignored on the side is, is going to be a challenge. So I'll just um, thank our research team again and our participants and acknowledge our funders. Thank you. We're ready for questions. So let me ask you a question, although in a, in, in a way you addressed it. Um, the, I totally agree with you that even with U equals U, um, this is an extremely important service and also a neglected service, including in my, my own country, the United States. Um, do you um, feel it's scalable? Because in fact, it could be quite, there could be quite a high demand if it became, um, well, it could be quite a high demand. Can it be scaled? I don't think it could be scaled in a public sector setting like we offered it. We wanted to show effectiveness, proof of concept that in fact, people would come, we could, we could do this and see no transmissions. And I think the next step is really to try and think about how it could be scalable. I do think actually dolutegravir provides an opportunity for it to become scalable because suddenly now fertility intentions are potentially something that are gonna be screened again, which I think the reality is that in general you come in maybe at the time of ART initiation, your fertility intentions are screened, but over time, it doesn't necessarily get revisited frequently, especially with these differentiated care models, which are wonderful, but keep us out of the facility and out of some of this repeat screening. So I, I do think that there will be some opportunities to do that, but I, I do think that it will come with some, it, it will need support indicators for, from PEPFAR, for example, and from other funders from the government to actually sort of force providers to offer the service. Thank you. If there's no other questions, we'll move to the next speaker. Thank you very much, Dr. Schwartz. Our third presenter is not Nellie Wadondu Kabondo, as you can tell. <laughs> uh, Andrew Old will be presenting uh, this paper. And Dr. Old is from the US Centers, U.S. Centers for Disease Control and Prevention in Malawi, who will be speaking to us about prevention, prevention of mother-to-child transmission and early infant diagnosis in Malawi, accomplishments of mature option B plus program in a resource limited setting. Thank you. 
Uh, good afternoon and thank you for uh, this opportunity to present on uh, prevention of mother to child transmission and early infant diagnosis in Malawi, accomplishments of a mature option B plus program in a resource limited setting. Uh, and as already mentioned, I'll be presenting on beh behalf of the first author, uh, Dr. Evelyn Kim and Dr. Nelly Wadonda, uh, who was originally scheduled to present these findings. So Malawi was the first country to launch Option B Plus, a test and treat strategy for the prevention of mother to child transmission of HIV in 2011, ahead of the WHO guideline uh, recommendations in 2013. Despite concerns around scaling up access as well as maintaining retention and adherence, routine Ministry of Health data demonstrate successful scale up with quarterly program data from 2017 showing that over 90% of HIV uh, positive uh, pregnant women were on ART. Still some questions remain around PMTCT coverage, retention and uptake of early infant diagnosis testing. The Malawi pop Population-Based HIV Impact Assessment or MFIA was conducted between 2015 and 2016 <coughs> and utilized a two-stage cluster design. The first stage sampled 500 enum enumeration areas across seven geographical zones and in the second stage, 14,268 households were randomly selected for survey participation. Eligible women, those 15 to 64 years of age, who were living in the selected households and were willing uh, and able to provide written consent, were interviewed on their most recent pregnancy in the last three years, an uptake of antenatal care and PMTCT EID services. The survey results included a national HIV prevalence of 10%, among adults 10 to six, uh, 15 to 64 with a 12.1% HIV prevalence among women aged 15 to 49. The objectives of this analysis uh, were to measure the PMTCT EID, EID cascade using the MFIA survey data and to assess factors associated with gaps in the cascade. The key steps in the cascade that we measured um, are illustrated in, uh, in the slide. They included antenatal care attendance, uh, known uh, HIV status during pregnancy, and that's either through testing offered at antenatal care for the current pregnancy or previously known status. Mother's uptake of ART during pregnancy, uptake of infant cotrimoxazole prophylaxis, and uptake of EID testing. The analysis was limited to the 3,598 women aged 15 to 49 years who reported a live birth in the three years uh, preceding the survey. And the survey data were weighted for design and non-response and jackknife replication was used to estimate variance. This table shows the characteristics of the women who reported a live birth in the three years before the survey by their self-reported HIV status. Those who reported being HIV positive tended to be older and also have higher uh, parity uh, and in addition, more HIV positive women reported that their most recent pregnancy was unplanned. This figure shows the PMTCT EID cascade based on the MFIA data. The first few steps in the cascade show high levels of antenatal care attendance with 99% reporting ANC attendance and high levels of HIV status ascertainment with 96% knowing their status during the pregnancy either through ANC testing or because of previously known HIV positive status. The light blue bars, uh, rep component of the bars, uh, represent HIV positive clients with about 7% of women self-reporting HIV positive status at the HIV status ascertainment step. So among these uh, HIV positive clients during their last pregnancy, 96.8% uh, reported receiving ART during pregnancy, 79.3% reported that their infant received cotrimoxazole and 51.1% uh, reported EID testing within two months of birth. Including those reporting an EID test two to 12 months after birth, and those tested later than 12 months, 79.7% reported that their child had an EID test by the time of the survey. Of those reporting EID testing, 3.9% reported and a positive um, uh, EID result. So because EID testing was the largest gap in the cascade, we looked at factors associated uh, with uh, EID testing uptake. Maternal education levels were strongly were associated with EID testing, with 43.6% of those with primary or less education reporting EID testing within two months of birth, 
versus 67.1% of those with secondary or higher education. In addition, uh, mother's disclosure of HIV status to her family was associated with EID testing. 54% of those who had disclosed to a family member versus 34.7% of those who reported not disclosing to a, to a family member reported EID testing within two months of birth. Uptake of infant cotrimoxazole prophylaxis was also associated with EID testing with 55.6% of, of, of those whose infants were on prophylaxis reporting EID testing within two months of birth versus 18.4% of those who reported that their infants did not receive prophylaxis. These associations were maintained in the multivariable model with those with secondary or higher education and those who disclosed their HIV positive status to a family member over two times more likely to have their infants tested within two months of birth. Those whose infants were on prophylaxis uh, were six times, so that's cotrimoxyl prophylaxis, were, were six times as likely to have timely EID testing. So in summary, the MFIA data show that uh, antenatal care attendance, awareness of HIV status, and uptake of PMTCT were high among Malawian women uh, reporting a live birth within the three years prior to the survey. EID testing within two months of birth, however, was the largest gap in the PMTCT EID cascade. Disclosure of HIV status to family members, maternal education level, and uptake of infant cotrimoxyl prophylaxis was significantly associated with timely EID testing. This analysis is subject to a few limitations. Since Symphia was a cross-sectional household survey, the temporality of EID testing and family disclosure cannot be established. In addition, the data used for analysis was self-reported and therefore possibly subject to social desirab desirability bias in reporting HIV status, ARV, Ustream pregnancy, and EID testing. So in conclusion, the MFIA demonstrates the success of Malawi's Option B Plus program with high coverage and uptake reported at multiple steps in the PMTCT EID cascade. However, EID testing, according to the national guidelines, remains a gap but may be improved by enhanced counseling on disclosure and increased uh, uh, infant cotrimoxyl prophylaxis uptake. Finally, while these results confirm good PMTCT program performance, identifying the remaining gaps and areas for intervention are key to achieving elimination of mother to child transmission in Malawi. So I want to acknowledge um, uh, the, the entire MFIA team, uh, all the study participants, uh, as well as the the Ministry of Health and the other organizations listed here. Thank you. Are there questions for Dr. Old? Go ahead. Thanks, uh, Mary May from UN AIDS. Thanks, had a great presentation. Um, quick question, one is the education one was kind of made sense, but I was just wondering if you could actually look at the knowledge of MTCT, just to take that a little bit further, mm -hmm. I think that's in the questionnaire, mm -hmm. to see what the women kn knew about MTCT mm -hmm. in terms of a direct implication for programs. Um, in addition, the 98, maybe you said this, the 98% ART coverage, was that self-reported? Yes, that's self-reported. Because we just wouldn't expect a woman being interviewed to say that she didn't take ART, or in my mind, that she wouldn't right. say she didn't take ART mm -hmm. if she had a baby in the last three years. And the last thing is just to look at, and, and related to that, look at the, um, the viral load suppression among pregnant women and mm -hmm. women just at least within the last year and where mm -hmm. that's at would be really interesting. Thanks. I agree completely. Uh, those are definitely some, some planned analysis, especially the viral load suppression rates, and we do have the ARV um, uh, data as well, which we can um, try and validate some of the self-reported ART use. Um, so, yeah, no, I agree with all those comments. Baba Tinji and the University of Maryland, thank you for that clear presentation. Um, did the exercise look at um, the uptake of vaccination according to the national immunization schedule? And was there any correlation between how many babies got vaccinated and how many babies got EID at two months? Mm -hmm. That's also a great question. Um, so are, are you asking me about data from the MFIA survey specifically or, oh, I'm sorry. As part of the MFIA exercise, did they ask about vaccination according to the okay. schedule and did yeah. they correlate that Got data it. with? 
To my knowledge, I don't think so, but I will definitely uh, follow up on that. Uh, it's a great question. Certainly uh, providing HIV testing services, whether it's EID or uh, other testing services at uh, child uh, clinics, uh, crucial to improving uptake uh, or uh, HIV case finding among our pediatric clients. Go ahead. Hi, Roger Shapiro from Harvard School of Public Health. Uh, thanks for that great presentation. Um, quick comment and then a, and a question. My quick comment is uh, I feel like collectively we shouldn't be using EID for testing that goes out to two months. I feel like that's not early. Um, and especially going beyond even calling it beyond eight, month, eight, mm -hmm. eight weeks. So I feel like we need to be changing our terminology mm -hmm. about the E. <laughs> the second, the second qu is a question. Uh, I wonder if you could comment on the complete disconnect between the receipt of cotrimoxazole and it being associated with the, 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 the um, mm -hmm. EID, because these are the kids, most, since most of those are negative, mm -hmm. they're the ones who really don't need cotrimoxazole, because we've shown that you don't need cotrimoxazole if the child's negative, mm -hmm. um, and, and that we should be probably moving to only using it in those with unknown status or obviously in positive children. So we have a complete disconnect in terms of who's getting it, mm -hmm. and I su suspect it has to do with the logistics or mm -hmm. you know, the biases in, in involved in who's in care, mm -hmm. but I wonder if you could comment on that. Great, yeah. Um, so I, I think uh, for the two-month time period issue, I think that's reflecting the, to some extent the, the national and the, and the PEPFAR indicators. But I agree. If we can get more granular on that on that indicator, that would be helpful. Um, in terms of the infant uh, cotrimoxyl prophylaxis, uh, th those are the uh, Malawian national guidelines, uh, to my knowledge. Um, but uh, I can certainly follow up on that and get back to you. Go ahead. Hi, Hi Lynn Robinson. Just a question: Is if it's the MFIA, then you should have um, testing results. So, what were your 18-month transmission rates? Mother-child mother transmission rates? Great question. I, I don't have those data on me now. Um, I don't have those data Some on me now. a round number, 2%, 5%, 10%? Uh, I only have the self-reported EID positive uh, test results, which were 3.9%. So it's 3.9% uh, in mm -hmm. like six weeks. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, I can definitely follow up on that and get, get that data to you. Okay. Because you did say like 97% of the women reported being on antiretroviral drugs, right? Yes. Okay. No further questions. Thank you very much for Thank stepping you. in like that. Thank you very much, and thank you to all the speakers who've done a really beautiful job of keeping to time. And so we want to move on and want to talk about birth outcomes and HIV-free survival with Option B plus in Lesotho, results from an observational prospective cohort study. And to do this for us, we have Dr. I hope I pronounce your name correctly, Apollonaire Tiam, who's a physician who has more than 15 years of experience treating HIV-infected patients. He holds a medical degree and a diploma in HIV management from the College of Medicine, South Africa, and a Master of Medicine from, in Family Medicine from the University of Witwatersrand in South Africa. He's currently the Director of Global Clinical Research for EGPATH, based in Washington. Welcome. Thank you very much, um, and thank you for the, uh, from the organizers for giving us the opportunity to present our study on birth outcomes and HIV-free survival with Option B+. Plus in Lesotho, the result of, uh, from our observational prospective cohort study. Uh, for many of you, you may have heard the name Lesotho. It has the second uh, highest prevalence of HIV in the world. It's a country completely enclaved within South Africa and uh, with peaks of HIV between 30 and 44 years, hitting more than 45%. And uh, we know that the combination of antiretroviral Therapy reduces mother-to-child transmission and improves maternal health. And Lesotho started implementing uh, Option B Plus uh, as one of the countries following Malawi in uh, April 2013. And um, there has been uh, scanned data 
on birth outcome of HIV positive uh, HIV exposed compared to unexposed infant. So we assess uh, birth outcomes and six weeks HIV free survivor among HIV exposed infant and HIV unexposed infant. In terms of method, uh, we had na a record of 941 HIV negative and 653 HIV positive pregnant women who were enrolled in the study. And the aim of the study was to evaluate the effectiveness of universal maternal uh, combination ART uh, rollout within routine program and HIV zero incidence among HIV negative women in 13 facilities within the country. So we included women who were attending ANC at the facility and who uh, were residing within that, the catchment area and who were willing to consent to participate in the study. And we excluded all those uh, who were residing uh, uh, temporarily within the catchment. Area and the birth outcomes we were talking about uh, infant birth weight, the maturity or estimated gestational age, the congenital anomalies, and the mortality. And uh, within the uh, uh, context of this study, we also introduced infant HIV birth testing by DNA PCR, uh, which was defined as testing within two weeks of birth, um, and uh, alongside with the routine six-week testing. Data were in, uh, analyzed to determine birth outcomes, HIV transmission, and HIV free survival at six weeks. And Kaplan-Meier method was used to estimate survival among HIV unexposed infant, uh, HIV free survival among HIV uh, exposed infant, and the associated 95% uh, percent confidence interval. The protocol was reviewed and approved by the various uh, institutional review board. So in terms of results, I would like to walk you through this, how the uh, enrollment went. So we had, uh, for the HIV positive arm, um, we had our HIV, uh, 921 HIV uh, uh, positive women who presented in the facility, and those who were eligible were about 724, and we enrolled the 653. Uh, and during pregnancy, there were about nine abortions. Uh, no maternal death, and 16 were lost to follow up, and uh, giving us a total of 628 deliveries. Uh, by the time of the analysis at six weeks, we had uh, we noticed that we had 20 stillbirth, in fact, deaths were 13, and uh, uh, we didn't have uh, uh, visit six week uh, visit for 12 of the participants. For HIV negative uh, women, we had a. Uh, more than 1,500 women who presented, and about 1,091 were eligible, and we enrolled 941, and the abortion were eight, maternal deaths were three, and lost to follow were 54, and delivery were 876. At the time of analysis of uh, six-week data, we had, uh, we noted the stillbirth and uh, infant, and uh, no a visit for 33. So uh, in terms of baseline characteristic of the study population, uh, the HIV positive women tended to be older and the uh, mean gestational uh, age at presentation, the uh, HIV positive uh, women actually presented earlier and more than 80% of our patients for both arms were uh, married and, um, and uh, more than 90% of them deliver in health facility. Uh, furthermore, in, in terms of disclosure, uh, uh, more than 60% of uh, HIV-positive uh, women disclose their HIV status to their husband or partner, while 55% of HIV-negative women disclose. And uh, those of those who were HIV-positive, 84% uh, uh, were on TLE, that's tenofovir, lamivudine, and efavirenz. And um, uh, considering partner relationship, uh, if you want to talk about zero uh, discordance, for those who were HIV negative, 4.2% of them uh, had a husband who was HIV positive. And of those who were HIV positive, 29.6% uh, had a partner or a husband who was uh, HIV negative. And um, of these, the, uh, for the HIV positive husband or partner of women who were HIV negative, on, uh, 14 out of 19 were taking ARVs and five were not. And um, of the other uh, the, the, uh, the group, um, 
uh, also for the, the, the other group who were the husband who were HIV positive like their wives, uh, the 72% were on ARV and 27% were not taking uh, any treatment. Considering the birth outcomes, um, we separated the initial birth outcome, you know, making clear the obstetric, the obstetric care, the quality of obstetric care, which is usually defined by the number of first still birth and uh, perinatal death, you know. In this cohort, uh, children were born uh, live birth and died within uh, less than two hours. Uh, we had 1.4% among HIV negative and 0.6% among HIV positive. And fresh still birth was 1.4 and 0.8. But for macerated still birth, uh, the rate of macerated still birth among HIV positive uh, women was almost three times that of HIV uh, negative or HIV unexposed infant. Uh, prematurity, uh, uh, HIV positive, uh, uh, HIV exposed infant were 8.3% um, uh, more likely to be, 8.3% um, uh, of HIV exposed infant were premature compared to 4% of uh, HIV unexposed infant, and this was statistically significant. And uh, in terms of congenital on, uh, anomaly, it was comparable between the two groups, uh, the, the uh, in terms, there were nine uh, uh, congenital anomalies among the HIV negative and about four, uh, giving a rate of 1% and 0.6% for HIV unexposed and HIV exposed, respectively. Talking about uh, the, uh, the survivor, so uh, we are not talking about the mortality. So the uh, mortality among, when we consider uh, stillbirth, the mortality among HIV unexposed infants was 4.5% and compared to 5%, and this was not as uh, significant. Even when we excluded the uh, stillbirth, it was 2.6% and 2.2%, uh, and you see that the uh, confidence interval overlaps n nicely. And when we it, it talk about the HIV-free survivor, now you look at the last three uh, columns of the, the second table, the HIV transmission at, uh, at six weeks, um, the HIV transmission at six weeks was 1.3%. And then the HIV, uh, the, when you consider that, when you add HIV infected and death, so it was, uh, the, the HIV free survivor was now 93.7%. And um, even when you remove the, uh, the uh, excluding the still birth, the HIV free survivor was 96 0.5%. In the method I mentioned that we introduced uh, birth testing in this uh, cohort. So in total, at six weeks, we had eight children who were infected, and out of these eight children, five were infected in, in utero. So I just wanted you to take note of uh, that. So and when we did uh, the survivor analysis, the Caprimaria, uh, there was no, uh, it just confirmed that there was no significant uh, the difference between the two. Uh, two population uh, in terms of survival between HIV unexposed and HIV uh, uh, exposed infant, whether you uh, had still birth or without still birth. So in conclusion, the HIV transmission rate by six weeks was low uh, at 1.3% among mother infant pair enrolled in universal ART prevention uh, of mother to ch child transmission program. And we observed higher rate of prematurity among infant born to HIV, expo uh, to HIV positive mothers. And six week uh, survival among HIV exposed infant was comparable to HIV unexposed infant. I would like to acknowledge uh, the, uh, the co-author and the co-investigator on the study and the study participant, the Ministry of Health, and the study team. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, and thank you for keeping to time. So we do have time for questions. If you'd like to ask a question, kindly go to the microphone. Please identify yourself, your name, and where you're from, and ask your question, starting with the microphone number three.
Thank you, Amy Sloger from Stellenbosch University. Thanks very much for a lovely presentation, Apollonie. I was just wondering if this cohort is going to be followed further beyond um, six weeks, because I think it's really reassuring that at six weeks of age, um, there was comparable survival between the HIV exposed and unexposed group. But the evidence seems to be converging around that the um, relative risk for mortality is actually in the post increased in the post neonatal period. There's this overwhelming risk for, for neonatal mortality in these settings in both groups, but where we're starting to see the difference in the excess mortality in HEU infants is actually in the post-neonatal period. So just wondering if the cohort will be followed and be able to look at that further. Yes, we are following the cohort until the, uh, the babies are 24 months. So we are following the cohort for two years postpartum. Thank you. Any other question? Okay, clear. You are very, very clear. Maybe I can ask you something about how do you get some of these mothers to deliver in their hospital facilities? I'm totally impressed with a very high facility delivery rate. Yeah, uh, in Lesotho, they practice, uh, uh, you know, free health services, you know, so, and I think that is, there's no fee for delivery. So, and I think that's free in very, Kenya. Somehow they're not coming. So I don't know what you're doing. <laughs> So, and then um, as a system, the Ministry of Health has developed uh, the structures to support the mothers when they come to facilities. Um, I cannot go into the detail, but it's highly advantageous for these women to come to facilities. They have uh, quite a bit of support. Um, and I think that goes with, uh, within other Southern African countries, you know, in terms of structure. Maybe it's hot chocolate and biscuits after <laughs> delivery, but really congratulations. Thank, thank you very much. Thank you very much. <laughs> So last and definitely not least, we have Claire Davis, who's um, from the University of Cape Town, South Africa. And I think we do need to acknowledge, Claire, I believe that you got an award this morning. So congratulations. And Claire is going to tell us about a cohort study on HIV-positive children in Southern Africa returning to care after being lost to follow up effects of interrupting care on mortality. Welcome, Claire, and congratulations. Thank you. Thank you very much. In a perfect world, a child with HIV would come to clinic, they'd be prescribed ART, and then they'd continue coming to clinic for regular monitoring and where we could ensure that they stay in good health. However, unfortunately in Southern Africa, the realities are far from this, and a lot of children instead are classified as last to follow up, with the potential for drug resistance, opportunistic infections, viral failure, and ultimately tracing studies have revealed higher mortality rates. Children may be more vulnerable to becoming lost to follow up compared to adults, given that they have to rely on an adult caregiver who may not have time to go pick up the ART medication, they may not want to, or they may not want their child to take drugs themselves. We don't know if the child continues taking existing medication, if they perhaps share medication with somebody else in the family, and because we don't have any clinical or laboratory monitoring, we don't know if they've progressed to AIDS or what their status is. On the positive side, we're actually finding that a large proportion of children eventually return to care. And so we term the period that they're away from care as a care interruption. Now, a few studies have assessed the long-term outcomes of children with care interruptions, and no known study has assessed the, the, or has quantified the impact of this care interruption. We all hypothesized that it's bad for a child, but we've not actually quantified this yet. Therefore, our objectives were firstly to describe the characteristics of children with a care interruption, to, to describe the characteristics of the period of loss, and finally to evaluate the association of that care interruption with mortality. We used data from the IDEA Southern African Database, which covered a period from 2004 to 2016. And it encompassed 126 clinics across six countries. There were approximately 46,000 children included in the study, covering 180,000 person years. So children could be included from when they were born and up until 16 years of age, so long as that they initiated ART before they turned 16. We had approximately 1,400 children die over the follow-up period. So just to break it down, of the 46,000, 22,000 remained in care throughout the follow-up period. We then split those with the care interruption into two groups. 
So we split those that were lost in the first six months of being on ART, and we had approximately 11,000 children being part of this group. Our second group comprised those that were lost after being on ART at least six months, and we had approximately 13,000 children being part of this group. And the reason for the split was based on the time that it can take for a child to achieve virological suppression. And it's an important point to note that we focused on the timing of the first care interruption. So in terms of our methods, our main outcome was all-cause mortality, and a care interruption was defined as a period away from care of 180 days. We only included children that were alive for the first 180 days that they were on ART for. And we used a Poisson regression model with robust standard errors and controlling for confounding variables. So just to understand person time allocation a bit better, a child would start on ART, they'd then attend clinic regularly, we used a hypothetical clinic date of 180 days, and if they hadn't returned to clinic by that time, we classified it as a care interruption. The child would later return to that clinic, and then either the database would close, or unfortunately the child would no longer would die. So before that time, before the time before a care interruption would be classified as group one, whereas the time after a care interruption would be classified into group two or group three, depending on when the child had the care interruption relative to when they started ART. So in terms of some of our characteristics, we had a relatively similar number of males and females being part of the study group, and we had no clinical significant difference between the age at ART initiation and your baseline CD4% at ART initiation. We did notice some differences in the interruptions between groups two and groups three. In particular, those that were lost in the first six months on ART tended to be lost for a longer period of time as part of their first care interruption. And there we have a median of 322 days compared to 244 days for those that were lost after being on ART at least six months. We also found that those in group two tended to be lost for an overall greater period of time, so that's 71 compared. 71% of their overall follow-up time compared to those in group two, which were only tended to be lost for 30% of the time. We also found that those in group two had higher rates of loss to follow-up when the database closed. Now, the results of our multivariate analysis showed that those that had a care interruption within the first six months on ART had a 3.23 times greater or association with mortality after adjusting for confounding variables. And this result was largely in line with our expectations. Um, treatment, stu treatment studies in adults have shown that the broken treatment can lead to higher mortality rates. I think this result also showed that early retention in ART programs is critical. However, we did not find any association with mortality in those that had a care interruption after being on ART at least six months. Um, and we hypothesized that perhaps it could be that these children shared medication. They were more likely to have extended supplies of medication. They could um, have longer time periods bef between their clinic visits. Um, interestingly, it does actually align with a study by a Konkai who studied adults who returned to care after being lost to follow-up and found that they had a suppressed viral load upon resumption of care. So what we did is we conducted a number of sensitivities. The first sensitivity, we adjusted the duration of care or duration of being out of care. And what we found that as the duration of the interruption increased, so the association with mortality increased as well. Secondly, we adjusted the time on ART before an, inter before an interruption. And what we found is that those with a care interruption wi within the first three months on ART had the greatest association with mortality. Finally, we conducted a cohort analysis, given that our analysis covered a number of different countries and cohorts, and we found that in six of the 16 cohorts, they showed that association with mortality. Eight of the cohorts uh, did not show an association, given that they didn't have enough mortality uh, rates or en enough deaths, and two of the cohorts, unfortunately, had to be eliminated due to multicollinearity. In conclusion, we found that care interruptions are important and children are likely to come back, um, or a large proportion of children do come back. And in second, we need to strengthen that retention of children in care in the early period of ART initiation, given that there is this 3.23 times increased mortality rate if you are lost within the six months of, after initiating ART. 
And I'd just like to acknowledge all the other IDEA participants and contributors. Thank you. Thank you very much, Claire. Are there any questions for Claire? Microphone three. Hi, Claire. Very cool presentation. I'm also from South Africa, Stellenbosch University. Um, Claire, something that I was um, thinking through as you're presenting is uh, in South Africa, we have serious inequality, and oftentimes um, treatment interruption is related to finances. And I'm wondering if you are comparing this to what's happening with the rest of the people in the household, i.e., are the mothers also HIV positive? Are they also being treatment? Is there also treatment interruption in their own care? And so we see like a kind of like a unit of treatment interruption, and I suppose the outcomes, um, health outcomes, might be even worse because of that. Yeah, th thanks for that question. Um, unfortunately, our database only comprised children, and we didn't have any linkages with the parents or the mothers. Um, but that'll be an interesting exercise to do. Go ahead, please. Hi, Claire. Wonderful Hi. presentation. Congratulations. Um, maybe I understood it wrong, but I uh, noticed in our multivariate regression model that early, younger age seemed also to be associated with um, lower rates of mortality. Is that uh, correct? So we adjusted for two types of age. So we adjusted for current age, which was in line. So infants have the highest association with mortality. I can go back to it. If you well, like. I guess I'm just curious to what degree it was younger children who start and drop off immediately that were dying faster. So sort of a moderation effect and what they could teach us about kind of differentiating care and kind of trying to get what do we do when it's, is it younger children in the first three months that are at highest risk, I guess, would be my question, looking at those. And if we could look at it in a bit more kind of uh, interaction effects to see what may be happening with the subgroups. That okay, yeah, Th thanks so much. Um, yeah, that would be an interesting exercise. I'll take, keep that in mind. Um, well, so far, we just adjusted for age. So the two, we adjusted for current age, as well as age at ART initiation. So maybe I could ask you a question and use a chair's prerogative. I know you're using a database, but the question is when the children come back into care, is it because there's something else that's brought them into the health facility? Is it because their health is deteriorating at that point in time? Or what is it that triggers the coming back into care? Um, well, unfortunately, we don't have that data too. Um, but we hypothesize, I mean, it could just be that they've moved back into the area um, it could be financial. Now that they've got a little bit more money, they can actually afford to go back to clinic. Um, it could be health-wise that they have deteriorated, and therefore they see a reason to go back to clinic. Um, but it'll be an interesting, yeah, we haven't done that. Thank you very much. And we do have a, let's congratulate Claire once again on her presentation. Thank you. Thank you. And we have a few minutes, Claire, if you would take a seat, we would like to open it up. If there are any other questions you would like to ask, perhaps one of the other panel members or something that wasn't clear or that you'd want to go back to, we have a few minutes. Please do go to the mic, identify yourself, tell us who the question is for, and we'll give them an opportunity to answer if there are any other lingering questions. So, yes, mic number three. Thanks. Uh, I'm Sayed Ahmed from Baylor in Malawi. I think one of the powerful things that... Andrew's presentation showed is that women are coming for ART, they're in the health system, um, yet the infant diagnosis, infant testing is so much lower. So there are multiple opportunities for the health system to capture the infants. They're usually with the mothers or the, the women are identified in terms of getting their ART. So this isn't just for Andrew, but if any of the panelists want to perhaps discuss ideas about utilizing that opportunity. It's one of the biggest ones with option B plus for infants is that the mothers are, are coming. They're coming monthly or um, quarterly. How can we use that to better identify infants and, and link them? Any of the panelists? Andrew, maybe starting with you, and anyone else would like to make a comment? Yeah, no, that's a great, that's a great point. Um, I think... Uh, I think that sort of integration of the pediatric and maternal care is, is, is definitely something that needs to needs to be looked at. I think the majority of the clients on ART, whether they're um, 
check on this, but whether they're pregnant or not, uh, are coming back every three months uh, for uh, a clinic appointment and drug pickup appointment. But still, that's every three months, so there should be that, uh, there should really be that 100% uh, EAD uptake, certainly within the, t the first 12 months. Um, but um, I think uh, there are a number of quality improvement exercises ongoing, and we have gradually seen an improvement over time. Uh, over the last two years, I think some of the program data has increased from a 40% a, a uh, EID coverage within 12 months uh, of birth to above 80% uh, for the majority of partners. Um, but I, I agree that's one, one key opportunity to uh, improve the uptake of EID. Yeah, I'll just, I'll just comment as well that I know health systems are quite different across right. countries, so it's difficult. The same clinic that I was presenting data from, uh, Vic Copen Clinic, they just recently finished an evaluation looking at a, a program to treat mother and infant pairs as dyads for 18 months in the same room so that any time the baby comes for a, a visit, the mom's also, her HIV care is, is provided and vice versa. And it looks like the early data do look like we're seeing an increase in testing and retesting over time um, because their care is more linked. But, um, you know, it really ends up being, I think, very health systems dependent upon whether or not that could be supported. I think we have one more question. Mic number two. The question is both for clarification. It's from the, the, the please, doctor. Please tell us who you are. Marcel Yotebien, Ohio State. Mm -hmm. um, the, 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 the high proportion of children that tested in, 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 in non-PMTCT care clearly demonstrate it was a targeted testing, and you only have about 59 children from emergency care where you were in high ho in, in, in five regional or national hospital, which is clearly not the number of children that come into that in emergency care in that service. How, how, what was the decision? How, if somebody have to replicate that, how did you select those children that were tested? Mm -hmm. Because I don't think I got that very clearly from the presentation. What was the criteria? And how do we identify because from the data presented from Malawi, we know that we are losing those children. We are not testing them at six, at six weeks, and after that, they, we, are, we, are, we lost them. How do we identify them after in the system to test them? Uh, th th thank you for the question. Uh, basically, the, the first aspect is that uh, we need to train people at those entry points because the way the health system was designed, um, we have those habits like when it's regarding the HIV, we are sent to the day hospital. So the first thing when we went to alternative entry point is that we train people, we help them with to design, to redesign the tools to take into account the new variable that are around the HIV in the test is, uh, in the tools that they are using in such a way that they are able. The second aspect is that uh, during the training, we help them about uh, key variable on the history of uh, moda baby pair, like for example, uh, a simple question: uh, If the moda is the one bringing the child. Uh, have you uh, done the, the test during the, uh, the antenatal consultation? If it is yes, then you have to show. If it is not, then we discuss with you to help you to propose the, 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 the test. And for those who are with caregiver, also, we discuss about uh, uh, the, the the possibility of have the 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 books of the moda. So basically, what I'm I'm trying to say is that on the process, you clearly mentioned it's a target test, but on the process, we make sure that at those entry points, they are they have a discussion, which is normally part of when you are receiving a patient. You discuss, and from that discussion, you are eligible to being proposed the test. The, uh, the testing for your child or not. And then uh, the rest, that means if you are eligible to be proposed a test, then the sample is collected at the entry point. You don't move the entry point. We collect it at the entry point and the lab, the point of care lab is within the health, health facility. In an hour or uh, two, uh, you can get the results. One aspect that I want to say also before I conclude is that 
we are talking about a health system when uh, the previous year the PNTC program was not optimal. We have missed opportunity of the uh, of pregnant women in the PNCC program, which means that this was an opportunity to catch up of missed opportunity of previous. For example, when you see an emergency, uh, we receive children with HIV advanced disease, which means that these are a small picture of survival. But what happened for those who were not able to arrive at the level of the system? Thank you. Thank you very much. Well, it seems like the panel has answered all the questions. So please join me in thanking our very stellar panel for the excellent job they've done. And also my very able co-chair. And my thanks to you. And please clap for yourself. You've been an excellent audience. And thank you very much for staying the course. Please have a great afternoon and enjoy the rest of the conference. <laughs>